historian tells you why everything you know is wrong. These lectures are on SoundCloud, iTunes, Stitcher, and other platforms. And if by any chance you can help to keep them coming, please go to my Patreon page. The link should be in the description. And I'm going to continue now with the lectures that I've been doing on the early modern era, right? How the Western world emerged out of the Middle Ages into the modern world that we know today. And this time I'm going to talk about witchcraft and the great witch hunt which are subjects that have become much more important and prominent in recent scholarship than really they've ever been before, right? The topic of witchcraft and witch hunting have always kind of been in the background of early modern history, but it has taken until recent years for scholars to sort of dig beneath the large-scale political narratives that have usually been historians' stock and trade and look at these kind of long-lasting, pervasive social subjects like folk beliefs and crime and justice and so forth. So the Great Witch Hunt, as I've mentioned before in lectures about the Middle Ages, the Great Witch Hunt is not a medieval phenomenon. It's an early modern phenomenon. And in fact, you could say it's really one of the defining fundamental features that distinguish the early modern era from what came before and what came after. I'm going to talk about where witch hunting came from and how it began. I'll talk about the scope of the witch hunt and how it worked, the beliefs that underpinned it, and I'll talk about different theories of why the witch hunt happened. Right? where this phenomenon that killed so many people came from, why it happened in the particular time and place it did. And finally, as part of that, I'll discuss the question of whether there really were any witches, right? which is a very complicated question that there has been a lot of back and forth debate about, and that is harder to answer than one might think. Okay, what, was there any sort of reality underlying this widespread and dangerous notion that certain people were witches? Okay, so to begin with, I'm going to talk a little bit about the world of popular culture and popular religion as we can reconstruct it in the medieval era, which is basically the world that witchcraft existed in and emerged out of. Okay, so as I've said, these, these categories of religion and culture are very problematic, and I tend to avoid them as much as possible, but they are terms that can apply in some kind of coherent way when we're talking about the Christian world. Okay, and if we look at the Middle Ages, especially the High and Late Middle Ages, we can see that there was a certain high culture. There was the, the literature of Latin, the art and architecture of the church, scholastic philosophy, but also alongside that high culture, or below it, to use the metaphor, there was also a popular culture, right? A culture of folk music and folk poetry, of handmade clothing, furniture, art objects that the peasant majority created and circulated in their everyday lives. This popular culture was, as anthropologists might say, blended or creolized. So it had elements that were drawn from indigenous traditions, belief in certain spirits, heroes, mythic figures, uh, certain holidays that persisted from ancient times into the Christian era, things like Midsummer Night and Walpurgis Night. And there was, as I've said in the previous lecture, a very complicated ritual calendar that people observed that regulated their times of work and leisure and celebration, and that involved all kinds of elements drawn both from 
Christianity and the Christian church and from this older so-called pagan well of traditions, okay? And, you know, we today would, would call it pagan. At that time, they didn't necessarily see it as pagan. They sort of put Christian labels and veneers on their various practices and teachings to make them fit and to make them acceptable in the Christian world. Alongside this ritual calendar were also everyday practices that were familiar to varying degrees to most people around Western Christendom. And these included a lot of protective and propitiatory practices, okay, a lot of which we today would label as magic, and some of them at the time also were labeled as magic, but even magic is really uh, a sort of elite intellectual category that we apply. But people would do things like have protective amulets, say a shiny object to deflect evil spirits or the evil eye. They might recite protective words or short prayers or incantations. Some of them might have a Christian meaning. Some of them might have no clear meaning at all, but just seem to have some sort of protective power. For example, the word ananazapta, which people would often write or speak, supposedly to protect themselves from the plague. Okay, There were all sorts of practices like this that people created, circulated, taught to one another that could help them in various ways against sickness, against accidents, against economic losses, and that could sometimes possibly be effective, and I'll talk about that in a moment, but more often probably just helped people psychologically to deal with their fears and anxieties and to give them some sort of feeling of control over their lives. It was widely understood all over Western Christendom that certain people were particularly learned or particularly adept in these protective practices or in what we sometimes could call magic, okay? And these people were referred to by a variety of kind of usually innocuous sounding names. And one that you hear in English is simply cunning folk, right? A person might be called a cunning man or a cunning woman or collectively cunning folk. And these were people who studied these sort of uh, magical powers and practices, who had some sort of special ability or preternatural talent in manipulating unseen forces. And it was very common for all sorts of people from all walks of life, both the elite and the populace, to consult with these cunning folk and to seek out their help. And sometimes the the cunning folk would, would even make an income and act as kind of professional consultants for these sorts of issues. You know, health, prosperity, love, communication with the dead, telling the future, and so on. If one had gone and spoken to a cunning man or cunning woman in the late Middle Ages or the 15 or even 1600s, one could bring a whole variety of different problems to them and they might give all kinds of advice in return, right? Use such and such magical object, uh, eat such and such a food or herb, do a meditative practice, say a prayer of, or an incantation, all kinds of things. And they might make reference to the time of year or the stars and astrology. Uh, They might invoke all kinds of ideas and belief systems. And we today might reject some of these as ridiculous, but others were not necessarily ridiculous. And in fact, a lot of the remedies that a cunning person might recommend to you might have a very good chance of working right? There were herbs that could uh, relieve pain or induce vomiting or treat infections. And the glosses or explanations that cunning folk might give for why these remedies would supposedly work, you know, were all over the map. And some of them we might today consider irrational or illogical, or, or maybe some of them were perfectly valid. But what we tend to do 
today is we tend to look back retroactively at these various practices and strategies that cunning folk could use. And we artificially divide them into those that we think make sense or might have been effective and those that we reject as nonsense. And the ones that we reject as nonsense, we label those as magic and say, okay, you know, so there's a sort of circularity where you say, well, uh, you know, anything that doesn't work is magic, and we know that magic doesn't work. But there were other practices that maybe were effective that for the people at the time were just as magical, right? Giving someone uh, an herb that somehow cures their pain also seems to be magic in, in precisely the same way as giving someone an amulet to defect, deflect the evil eye or things like that. So this sort of mass of complicated, interrelated practices that can only be reconstructed very painstakingly and piecemeal from the surviving records from the Middle Ages, it presents a lot of strange conceptual problems and ambiguities. And not surprisingly, the learned elite at the time, as far as we know, what they thought about the cunning folk and magic. The elite was very divided, and their interpretations went back and forth and were often confused. You know, how do we treat these sort of magical practices? Are they harmful? Are they harmless? Are they effective? Are they ineffective? Are they based on real knowledge? Are they based on delusion and ignorance? Are they based on evil powers, demonic, diabolical, you find thinkers in the Middle Ages going back and forth on all of these questions. But in general, the elite, especially the church elite in the Middle Ages, tended to be extremely skeptical about cunning folk and magic. Okay, the normal mindset usually was that the vast majority of the supposed magical powers and diviners and healers are just delusional, right? They they are sort of phantasms caused by mental problems or maybe caused by demons or the devil deceiving people into thinking that they can do things or know things that they really don't. Some sources are very dismissive and basically shunt all of these sort of magical and divinatory practices into the category of heresy. Okay, and a very important early example of this, uh, of this mindset is captured in a document from the early Middle Ages called the Canon Episcopi, which is a document a few pages long, basically giving advice to bishops, right? And Episcopi means bishops giving advice to bishops on how to deal with people who have delusions that they have various sorts of magical powers, like leaving their bodies, changing shape, telling the future, and so on. And the document basically advises bishops to treat these practices and beliefs as heresy, right? Because in the author's view, these practices don't really happen. They're delusion. And to believe in them, to believe that they are real, is to go against basic Christian teachings, okay? So the advice is to treat them as heresy, and of course the normal approach to heresy in the Middle Ages was to pressure people to confess their error and their sin and to repent and return to the orthodox teachings of the church. So this was the common practice, it seems, through most of the Middle Ages. The Canon Episcopi was probably written somewhere around 900, okay? The earliest known copy of it appears in a book from Central Europe from the year 906. It most likely was written a little earlier than that, maybe in the time of Charlemagne or Louis the Pious, or maybe around 900, but it was copied and circulated many times over and seems to have been treated as an authoritative text for several hundred years afterwards. In the High Middle Ages, there were some thinkers who took 
the ideas of magic and divination a little more seriously and who gave some credit to the idea that there is some reality to some of these things like the evil eye. And, for example, Thomas Aquinas argued that some seeming magical powers are actually wonders and strange deeds performed by demons. And he, he argued for the existence of certain sorts of demons like incubi and succubi that can take over parts of your body. And that basically people should stay away from magic and divination because it implies that they're somehow being influenced or manipulated by demons or even by the devil himself. So exactly what the scope of real magic was, was ambiguous, but... Generally, the church treated accusations of agreements or deals or bargains with the devil as spurious, right? So it seems as if this idea sometimes came up and circulated, especially among the commoners, that certain people not only were cunning, but actually were witches. They were people who used magic to bad ends and they somehow borrowed these powers from demons or from Satan, right? And this was, of course, a, a very dangerous uh, and frightening idea that certain people were borrowing and using demonic powers against other people. And the church generally tamped this down, right? And argued that that these sorts of evil powers to, to make people sick or even kill people were not real and that there was no bargain with the devil or pact with a demon that created witches or witchcraft, right? That was really a sort of suppressed fringe idea. Okay, why did this start to change? After about 1400, for unclear and obscure reasons, some people in the elite, both in the church and in royal governments, began to look at magic and divination more seriously and to entertain the idea that maybe there really were witches using evil powers that they derived from demonism. So over the course of the 1400s, there were some scattered sporadic witchcraft trials around Europe by both church and state courts. But they tended to be sort of confused and to give out usually light punishments, right? The inclination was still usually to treat witchcraft, if it happened at all, as a heresy. But sometimes these courts did start to hear and entertain accusations seriously that witches were really using actual hidden powers to harm other people, right? And they start to take more seriously the idea of maleficium, sort of evil doing or the doing of harm, which was the technical Latin term used as a kind of equivalent or substitute for witchcraft. We can see, though, that in these trials, a certain sort of conspiratorial fear and paranoia was growing, okay? There was an increasing notion around Europe that various sort of shadowy powers, enemies of the peace, enemies of the church, were combining together to threaten Christendom. These, this included Jews and lepers, as I talked about in lectures in on the Middle Ages. It included the outside Muslim powers. It included heretics that were growing into bigger movements. And it now also included witches, okay? People who made direct pacts or agreements with Satan. Still, the great witch hunt did not really take off until the 1480s. And it seems as if the spark that lit the fire came from one particular man named Heinrich Kramer. And he was an inquisitor on a certain inquisitorial court in Innsbruck in the Tyrol region of Austria. And we don't know a lot about where he came from and his background, 
But in 1484, the Pope issued a bull or a special proclamation, which, for one thing, openly recognized the existence and danger of witchcraft. And it specifically named Heinrich Kramer as having authority to investigate and, if necessary, prosecute witchcraft. So for about three years, from 1484 to 87, Heinrich Kramer drove and presided over a kind of campaign of investigation and trials into supposed witchcraft in the Tyrol region in Austria. At the end of that period in 1487, the other authorities in the Tyrol came to the conclusion that Cromer was dangerous and out of control, and they removed him from the Holy Office and expelled him from the monasteries in that region. So he was a, a Dominican friar. He was a member of, of the learned uh, order of preachers. And it does seem he was taken seriously for a while in that period in Innsbruck before he then was basically cast out and unofficially ostracized by the Dominican order and by the other authorities. After he had been removed from his position, he, as a kind of revenge possibly, wrote a book called Maleus Maleficarum, which is an ambiguous title. It means on one level, the hammer of the witches, right? Malaeus can mean harm or weapon or specifically hammer used as protection against something. And maleficarum means uh, witches, right? Th those who do evil. On another level, it can also simply mean the harm done by evildoers or the harm done by witches. And in Malaeus maleficarum, Cromer set out to make three basic points. Firstly, that witchcraft is real and that it does real harm, right? Witches actually do have hidden demonic powers, which they can use to harm or kill people, to deceive them, and to sow chaos. Certain sorts of people tend to be witches, okay? People who have some sort of physical or psychological weakness, are more prone to be seduced and make a pact with the devil to give them power, right? So, so having a sort of weakness or vulnerability makes you a target for recruitment into Satan's uh, you know, secret conspiracy. And specifically, most witches are women, right? This was one of Cromer's key arguments. Women have these sorts of physical and psychological vulnerabilities. And thirdly, there are methods that one can use in order to identify witches, right? So Cromer argues that one can find certain unusual marks on a person's body, like a third nipple or a birthmark or scar that looks like a nipple, because these supposedly are the places where a witch feeds his or her familiars, right? Sort of demonic animals that follow a person around and suck their blood as a way of kind of extracting a toll from that person for Satan. Okay, so this last section of Maleus Maleficarum basically serves as a kind of manual for witch hunting, for identifying and trying and condemning witches. Okay, so Maleus Maleficarum is published in 1487, just shortly after he is forcibly retired from the Holy Office. And Cromer adds a preface to Maleus Maleficarum, which claims that it has been unanimously endorsed by the Faculty of Theology of the University of Cologne, right? A very uh, prestigious German university. This apparently was false, right? So it's this is a false imposture. It was never approved by any qualified you know, faculty of theology. And in fact, the Dominican order, the Inquisition, and the church all pretty quickly repudiated Cromer's ideas and considered them you know, extreme and, and unsupported. However, nonetheless, the book proved very popular. It was reprinted multiple times 
for the next 200 years. There were over 20 different editions published all over Europe. And it was widely read, circulated, and used particularly by royal and state authorities that were interested in rooting out witches. Okay, so it it was never recognized or widely used by church authorities, which tended by and large to be more skeptical of witchcraft accusations, but it became a great hit and a bestseller among secular courts and magistrates, judges, prosecutors, as well as simply the general reading public that could read Latin and was interested in this very sensational and titillating subject of witchcraft. So Malleus Maleficarum seems to be a key factor in kicking off the sort of craze for witch hunting, which overtakes Europe for more than 200 years, from about 1487 till around 1700, right? This is really the witch hunting era. So it's at the same time as the Renaissance and the Reformation, right? This is, this is the age of witch hunting. It diminishes gradually after about 1700, and uh, I'll talk about that later, and, and I won't get into all the reasons just yet, but I'll concentrate on the sort of great age of witch hunting, which was about 1487 to 1600. So in this age of witch hunting, it seems, you know, the records are incomplete, we can't know for sure, but it seems as if in total, historians estimate that probably 60 to 80,000 people were killed as witches. Okay, and when you consider how spotty the records actually are in a lot of Europe, I, I would venture to guess that it's probably a little more than that. It might be more in the 80 to 100,000 range. Now, you might remember when I talked about the Spanish Inquisition, over its lifetime, which was about the same as the witch hunting era, more or less, uh, the Spanish Inquisition killed about three to 5,000, at least 3,000 maybe more like 5,000 people. So we're talking, when we look at the witch hunt, we're talking about 20 times as big a phenomenon, right? Something that, you know, had never been carried out on such a scale before, probably in known history, this effort to root out and execute thousands of ordinary civilians. And it was really, the casualties were close to that of a sizable war of that time. It was, of course, only a small fraction of people that were actually killed, but nonetheless, it was enough people over the years that practically everybody knew of somebody, someone in their extended family or clan, someone in their village, who at some point was executed as a witch. And this is apart from thousands of others who were imprisoned, threatened, very often tortured as accused witches, even if they were not ultimately executed. The main core of the witch hunt was in Central Europe, particularly in Germany, Switzerland, and Austria. Right? And you might remember the original sort of fanatic for witch hunting, Cromer, was in Innsbruck. And it seems as if the, the, the real epicenter was that area. Around half of the people killed as witches were in that central German-speaking region. But there also were thousands killed in France, in Scandinavia, uh, somewhat smaller numbers in Italy, Britain in the Baltic countries, it really was pervasive. It reverberated all over the continent, although it was somewhat less so in some countries, such as England, Spain, and Italy, for various reasons. The main height seems to have been between 1560 and 1630, right? So in those generations, Basically, the era of Elizabeth and James I in England, the era of Philip II in Spain, uh, this time that we think of as sort of the height of the high and late Renaissance, uh, this was the most intense witch hunting period. And many of the leaders, the leading philosophers, statesmen, diplomats of that age believed very much in 
the danger of witchcraft and wrote and sometimes took part in witch hunting. Now, one country that that was slightly different and aberrant was England, as I mentioned. In England, there was no inquisitorial office, right? There was there were only royal courts overseen by royally appointed magistrates and judges of various sorts. And they seem to have been the most skeptical or among the most skeptical in Europe of the whole idea of witchcraft. It's not clear exactly why. One reason is probably that there was a very developed and entrenched tradition of common law in England, and fairly independent local courts around England tended to apply the common law as they were accustomed to, and this traditional common law simply didn't have a place for witchcraft. It just wasn't part of that inherited legal tradition. So in England, it didn't reach the scale that it did in many other countries where it was more possible for the ruling elites to create new laws, new decrees, and to get them effectively enforced. So witch hunting tended to be very much a top-down endeavor, right? Belief in witchcraft was very widespread, but it really couldn't get anywhere unless you had authorities from the top, from the royal governments, and sometimes from the Inquisition, searching for and encouraging accusations and using the full force of the law to prosecute them, right? So it seems as if for, for whatever reasons between the 14 and 1500s, the attitudes of the elites changed dramatically from looking askance at the whole idea of witchcraft to taking it extremely seriously and encouraging witch hunting. As I said, in England, this was more unusual. It didn't get nearly as far. There were far fewer witch trials. And the one episode that really stood out and when that produced most of the witch executions in England's entire history was uh, spurred on by a man named Matthew Cook, who traveled around eastern England in the East Anglia region between 1644 and 47, claiming to have a special commission from Parliament empowering him to seek and find and prosecute witches. So he, he passed off a false patent from Parliament, giving him the supposed title of Witch Hunter General. So he was a charlatan, you know, much like Cromer. He also was a charlatan. And like Cromer, he, he claimed to have endorsement from higher authorities, like Cromer claimed to have the backing of the Faculty of Theology at Cologne. And it seems Matthew Cook uh, stirred up you know, fear and paranoia about witches, rounded up accused people, and oversaw the executions of about 300. So that is more than half of all the people executed for witchcraft in England, just in his three years of activity from 1644 to 47. And it happens that this was during the period of the English Civil War. So it was a time of great uncertainty, division, and confusion, really, about who was in power and who had what authority. And this episode of the Witch Hunter General seems in some ways emblematic of how witchcraft tended to take off as a phenomenon, right? It was during times of uncertainty, fear, social division, that someone would step in claiming to have some sort of knowledge and authority and would scapegoat supposed witches, right? As a way of playing on people's fears and trying to give them some feeling of, of protection or control. Later, after this Witch Hunter General episode, the English were quite embarrassed and really, in some sense, probably frightened by what had happened. And after about 1650, there was a gradual reappraisal and suppression of the idea of witch hunting. And witchcraft trials became less and less common, really, first in England and then all over Europe. It started to diminish after 1650 or so. Now, a lot of you probably have heard of the most famous witch hunting episode, 
probably in the world, but especially in the United States, which is the Salem Witch Trials in 1692. And I won't get deeply into the details of those. You can read about them all over the place, and I'll probably discuss them later when I get to the American colonies. But part of what makes the Salem Witch Trials so remarkable, which, you know, led to the deaths of 20 people in Salem in 1692 to 93, is that they were really at the very tail end of the witch hunting age, right? Those sorts of outbreaks of, you know, paranoid uh, rounding up of accused witches was almost unheard of by that time, right? There were some, there were some trials in a few in England, there were a few in the Connecticut colony in the 1660s, but Salem really stands out, and there were particular political conditions that, again, made witch hunting possible in that time and place. The elites who were in power at that time in the Massachusetts colony had all been compromised in some way by their association with the government of the Catholic King James II, and I won't get into that whole story, but basically the loyalty of the judges, the magistrates, the governor at that time to the cause of Protestantism was in doubt. And witch hunting was a way for them to sort of deflect and cover over that stain on their own credibility. It also was a way for people to express and try to assuage their fears of Native Americans, right? At a time when a lot of the outlying towns around Salem, north of Salem, had been under attack, and there was great fear of that threat. And Mary Beth Norton has written a book, uh, In the Devil's Snare, where she sort of illustrates this close connection between the fear of witches and the fear of Native American uh, attacks. But again, I won't get deeply into that. I'll just point out that in this way, Salem again fits this pattern where witch hunting would break out when people with power and prestige and authority would encourage it and would play on people's fears instead of tamping down on witchcraft fears as they had generally done in the Middle Ages. Okay, so what was witchcraft in the eyes of people who made witchcraft accusations and who prosecuted witches? Well, as I mentioned, it was the use of magical powers like uh, attacking people's bodies or souls, giving them nightmares, attacking livestock, attacking infants in many cases, uh, causing people economic harm and distress, doing so through an agreement, whether conscious or unconscious, a pact with Satan or his representatives, and participation in a sort of grand satanic conspiracy by going out at night on particular special nights, especially Thursday nights, and joining in a sabbat, right, where these witches usually would join together in a field or a forest, they would celebrate profane rites, they might desecrate the cross or the sacraments, they might engage in some sort of sexual play with each other, with animals, especially a goat, and they would give worship and veneration to some sort of angel, right, which might be the devil himself or representative of the devil. So this is more or less the myth that witch hunters and witch accusers ascribed to and perpetuated. Whom would they accuse? Well, the majority of the people accused of witchcraft were women. We know that we know that fairly surely from the surviving records, but they were not all women. Somewhere around roughly three quarters of the people accused and of the people executed for witchcraft were women. They tended to be peasant women, ordinary, often impoverished women. They were very often on the fringe of society or the, the fringe of their local community. They might live outside a town or village. They might live alone. They might not have a lot of relatives, a lot of close social relationships. This could make them 
on the one hand, more vulnerable, right? They wouldn't have people to defend them and speak up for them. It also could make them more suspicious, sources of fear, uh, easy scapegoats. The people accused of witchcraft were of all ages, however. It's not apparently true that most of them were old. That's a sort of folk stereotype. They could be of all ages. Some did have children, some did not. And most of the accusers were other women, right? It tended most, in most cases, it was women accusing other women. And it seems a very frequent scenario that led to witchcraft accusations was when there was a woman who was unable to support herself, didn't have a lot of kin to help her. She was alone. She was viewed with some degree of suspicion. And she would go to a neighbor or a distant relation, someone in the area, and ask for help, right? Ask for alms or for food. And the person that they asked for help would refuse. This would lead to conflict, recriminations, and the woman who had asked for help would leave in anger, maybe muttering curses. Then later, the person who had refused them would fall on some kind of misfortune, would fall sick or have some inexplicable pain or nightmares, and they would then accuse the other woman of having bewitched them, right? Now, you know, it's easy to think of various sorts of possible interpretations or explanations for what was happening here other than, you know, magic, which, you know, you, you, you might believe in that or you might not, but there are metaphysically simpler explanations. For one thing, probably a lot of the people who refused help to these vulnerable women felt guilt, right? They felt guilt and anxiety for having to turn this person away. They felt resentment, and this guilt and resentment uh, manifested itself in feeling ill, feeling unwell, feeling pain, or simply in paranoia, right? Fear that bad things happening in your life have something to do with this refusal, this person that you turned away. Okay, so that seems to be more or less the scenario that often recurred and led to witchcraft accusations and in some cases to witchcraft trials, right? Now, this doesn't necessarily explain why was there this enormous explosion in witchcraft accusations and trials beginning in the 1400s and lasting through the 15 and 1600s, right? What, what were the conditions of that particular time period that created this explosion of witch hunting? Well, there are several factors that different historians have pointed out that might, in different ways, have contributed and that some historians have built different theories on, okay? One factor is simply the fear of heresy, right? As I said, there were growing heretical movements like the Waldensians in France and Italy, the Lollards in England, and, and others that were undermining confidence in the church and its teachings. And increasingly, both church and state authorities wanted to crack down on these heresies, and witchcraft originally in the medieval era was viewed as a form of heresy, right? So as heresy grows as an increasing threat, so do fears and accusations of witchcraft, right? It gets sort of uh, lumped together with these growing religious threats. This, of course, is only multiplied by the Protestant Reformation, right? Which from the point of view of the Catholic world is an enormous outbreak of heresy, right? At the same time, of course, Protestants fear Catholics, right? And the, the Catholic Church and their desire to reverse and suppress the Protestant Reformation. And we do know that if you were a Catholic in a majority Protestant area or vice versa, a member of a Protestant minority in a Catholic area, you were especially likely to be accused of witchcraft, right? So certainly at least one factor in these accusations was uh, was fear and resentment towards people on the other side 
of this deepening religious divide in the wake of the Protestant Reformation. But we can't attribute it all to the Reformation because we know it began about 30 years earlier, right? So it, that is not the only factor. Another important condition that clearly must have contributed was the social and economic strain of the time, right? And this is something that we don't think about or generally know about much in this era, but I discussed this in my last lecture about the life of the commoners. There was extreme strain on the peasant majority in this era, right? Uh, higher prices, low wages, uh, loss of control of land, rising rents and taxes, and more and more people were really being squeezed, just trying to hold on to their land and to feed themselves. So in this time, you had more and more people looking for help and more and more people having to refuse to help the other people in their communities, right? So it was, it was a time of increasing friction and conflict, even just among ordinary people, among relatives, among neighbors, as sort of the economic screws were turned on people. And the idea of witchcraft and witchcraft accusations were probably a major outlet for these feelings of paranoia, of guilt, of frustration from this social and economic strain. On the religious and metaphysical level, the historian Keith Thomas, who wrote the sort of seminal book, uh, Religion and the Decline of Magic, argued that there is a sort of ecclesiastical and religious reason for why people built up these fears of witchcraft and why they increasingly brought these fears and accusations to royal authorities in this era. And it's that there was a thoroughgoing reform in the church, right? Both in the Protestant world, following the Protestant Reformation, and then also in the Catholic Reformation as well, which I'll talk about later. Church authorities suppressed all kinds of practices that they considered dubious and that they saw as unwarranted according to Orthodox teachings, okay? these sort of elaborate cults of saints, which often involved kind of magical rites, objects associated with saints, images, special prayers or incantations that could seem like magical prayers, all kinds of objects, ideas, images, words that people used as protection, right? Like I said before, that people used to try to deal with their fears of disease or crime or poverty. Increasingly, the churches discouraged and even condemned these various uh, kind of quasi-magical practices. You know, don't go parading around with statues of some weird saint who might not even have been a real saint, right? Don't carry around amulets. Don't say magical words. So, in effect, the churches, in Keith Thomas's view, drew away the sort of protective shields that people used against dangers and sources of evil. And because they, the people were losing access or were having to give up these protective shields, they turned instead to royal authorities, right? when they were afraid that someone or something was using evil magic against them, they felt that they had to go to a court, to a magistrate, and say, please protect me, right? And the only way that a magistrate can do that, you know, they can't use counter magic, right? They don't have that, they don't have that sort of metaphysical power. In order to protect people, they had to prosecute the supposed evildoers, right? And they can't prosecute a demon, they can't prosecute a ghost or the devil. They have to find someone who is supposedly in league with the devil, who is supposedly using these diabolical powers, and jail them, and force them to confess, and prosecute them, and sometimes execute them. Okay? So there's sort of the, as metaphysics and religious practices change, the law has to step in, into the vacuum. Right? That's more or less Thomas's argument. Now, there also was most likely some degree of political reason as well. Okay, 
Now, remember, as I've been saying over and over again through so many lectures, this era, the early modern era, was a monarchical era, and it was a time of state consolidation, right? It was a time when the elites at royal courts and some noble courts or republican governments were striving to consolidate authority around a central site, right? So that they could control and streamline legal administration, trade and economic development, philosophy, art, theology, all of this was being pulled together around consolidated sites of authority, especially kings and queens. And in order to do that, it was very useful to have an outside enemy, right? You have to bolster your own authority and focus loyalty on your leader by presenting those leaders as protectors against some outside threat, right? And as I've said before, there were various parties that people used over the years as this outside threat. Jews was a major one. Uh, you know, the Muslim powers, sometimes others, heretics, and witches were a convenient target for this sort of project of consolidation of authority because they were supposedly part of some grand, dangerous conspiracy centering on the great adversary, Satan. Now, one of the arguments in favor of this idea is indirect. It's one can see support for this notion of a political cause for the witch hunt when you consider where the great witch hunt didn't take off, right? Where there were very few or almost no formal witch trials. As I said, there were very few in England and in Italy, but especially Spain and Portugal. It was practically unknown. There was no concerted project to hunt out witches in Spain and Portugal. Why? Well, in Spain and Portugal, you had a very powerful and active Inquisition, right? And that Inquisition already had a sort of ready-made internal enemy to hunt out, and that was crypto-Jews and crypto-Muslims. Right? These sort of uh, you know, secret, non-Christian heretics within the Christian fold. Right? So in Spain and Portugal, you didn't need witches. Right? But in countries like France, the Holy Roman Empire, also Scotland, where you didn't have crypto-Jews or crypto-Muslims or conversos, witches played that role instead. You can even go to the very top of the political food chain and see actual rulers who were personally involved and invested in the witch hunt and in some way saw it as part of their duty to undertake witch hunting. A very uh, interesting example is King James I of England, who also was King James VI of Scotland, and he was the most enthusiastic ruler in the witch hunt. He wrote a book himself about witchcraft and how to find witches. So he, you know, he devoted a lot of his own time to this witch hunting project at the same time that he was also striving to join together and integrate his two realms of Scotland and England, right? So there does seem to be a, a concordance and overlap between the political project of centralization around monarchs and witch hunting. Now, there's a good chance that some of you have also heard of other kind of popular theories about witch hunting, like the notion that the fungus ergot, which could sometimes grow in grain stores or in bread, somehow caused witch hunting outbreaks. Now, it is true that ergot is a sort of mild hallucinogenic. It can make people more suggestible to hallucinations or, or delusions. And sometimes when ergot grew in particular grain stores, you might also have kind of group uh, engagements in, in delusions or, or visions. Now, it certainly is possible that ergot was a factor in some witch outbreaks, but it probably doesn't have nearly as much explanatory power as the popular theory likes to think. Uh, for one thing, you know, there have been 
funguses like ergot in various food supplies intermittently for millennia. You know, it's not something that just started in the 1480s and then somehow died out in the 1700s. So it cannot explain why witch hunting suddenly rose and fell in this particular era. And it probably can't explain much of the particular witch hunting outbreaks. Because, you know, when you're talking about, say, for example, the Salem witch trials, which really spread all around Essex County, the whole sort of area north of Boston, it's not as if everybody in Essex County was eating from one supply of wheat or oats. You know, it was it was various different people in different towns taking up this delusion of witchcraft and, and Satanism. And, of course, it doesn't explain the content of witch mythology, right? The idea that people ride out at night, meet in this Sabbath on particular nights, sign the devil's book, venerate the devil, uh, you know, kiss goats, bodies, you know, th- th- this stuff is not explained by by Urgot, even if perhaps Urgot made people more suggestible and made people believe these stories and sort of hallucinate them more readily than they otherwise would, right? So at best, it's one small factor. Now, to take up this question of what did people believe about witches and why, okay? Where did this mythology come from, okay? We know that this sort of notion of the witch's Sabbath developed by about the mid-1500s and was pretty clearly in place and was subscribed to both by church and state authorities by about the mid-1500s, even if they went about prosecuting witches in different ways, even if they had different notions about how real it was, they still had this sort of shared story of who are witches and what do they do, right? And some of it came from Maleus Maleficarum. Some of it seems to have been cooked up gradually and elaborated later. Why did they think this, and did it have any sort of correlation to reality? Okay, were there really witches? Okay, not necessarily in the sense that people really went out and, you know, signed a, the, a book belonging, belonging to Satan or Satan's angel, uh, but were there really witches, at least in the sense that some people really thought they did these things? Did some people really consider themselves to be witches and really think that they had special magical powers deriving from a pact with the devil? Okay, that's a more serious question. We know that a lot of people confessed to it, but those confessions are all questionable because, for several reasons. One, because many of them were tortured, right, and were threatened and forced into making these confessions. Some people, such as in Salem, made these confessions after having been promised leniency if they confessed and accused others, right? So there was an, inf- an incentive to confess even if you weren't tortured. And furthermore, even if some people sincerely made these confessions without, without torture, without threats, it may have been sort of the power of suggestion, right? People might have had dreams or nightmares that they were persuaded to think were real because that's what everyone around them was saying and telling them. So it's a very shaky question. Even though we have a pretty good quantity of records from all over different parts of Europe, it's still a a very shaky question. Were there really witches? Did some people really think they were witches? And does this derive from some sort of real folk belief or practice or experience? Well, for a long time, the assumption was just, well, you know, the masses are delusional. You know, the masses have strange ideas, but there's no substance to it. This idea was first aggressively challenged by a historian named Margaret Murray in the 1920s and 30s who argued that there was, in fact, a surviving pagan fertility cult centering on a sort of horned god of fertility 
and that certain people in Europe through the Middle Ages and the early modern centuries actually did go out at night and meet in groups and revere this sort of pagan fertility horned god and that the church simply misrepresented this surviving pagan cult as being uh, diabolical right and satanic but in in murray's thesis the parts of these confessions where people said we profane the sacraments we abjure the church murray argued that this was true that there were people who adhered to these pre-christian beliefs who needed an outlet to express their resentment and anger towards the church okay and that this was a necessary part of passing on and perpetuating this pagan cult okay so this argument has been referred to sort of by shorthand as simply the margaret murray thesis and some scholars were persuaded or agreed with the thesis to some degree that that witchcraft was in fact an artifact of surviving pre-christian beliefs and practices which opposed the hegemonic christianity and this argument also incidentally was the inspiration for the modern wicca movement right the idea that you can reconstruct something of this surviving pagan religion and and continue to practice it in the modern world as a kind of distinct parallel religion apart from christianity right now the margaret murray thesis was very aggressively challenged in the 1950s 60s and 70s by historians who pointed out all the ways in which the stories contained in these elaborate confessions were extremely dubious and seemed to represent sort of fears and anxieties that people could project on one another, right? Fears of suppressed sexual desires, bestial sexual desires, fears of, of course, black magic and evil forces and simply the unknown, and that which accusations were a way of sort of projecting those fears and hatreds and anxieties off onto somebody else, right? And Norman Cohn, for example, wrote a book in the 1970s called Europe's Inner Demons, where he basically argues that this was all pure fantasy, there was nothing like witchcraft. It was just sort of, you know, suppressed people letting out their, their neuroses, their neurotic fantasies. Okay. Now, this school of thought also, of course, has been challenged in more recent years, especially since the 1990s. So the latest sort of school of interpretation to arise can be seen in some ways as a kind of compromise between the Margaret Murray thesis and the pure fantasy, you know, inner demons thesis. And this sort of new wave has been led most of all by Carlo Ginsberg. And Carlo Ginsberg is a fairly famous, you know, widely known, widely read Italian historian who is most famous for a short book called The Cheese and the Worms which he in which he looks at the inquisition trial records of a particular man called Minocchio who was a miller in Italy in the 1500s and tries to reconstruct the sort of distinctive ideas and worldview of this particular man and it's a very short easy to read book but what not as many people know is that the cheese and the worms was just a sort of small offshoot side project from a much bigger undertaking that began with his doctoral thesis where he was examining a surviving pagan fertility cult of some mysterious sort in northeastern Italy in the 1500s and that, that this particular man, Minocchio, was sort of a, a little odd case that he found during the course of this much wider investigation of people in the whole region of northeastern Italy who believed that they were in some way shamanic okay they were a, they were sort of shamans in a sense people who believed that they were in some way marked out from birth 
as special people with magical abilities, and specifically the ability to for their souls to leave their bodies on particular nights of the year and travel out into the night with animals or in the forms of animals and go on various adventures, battling evil spirits, and and so on. And I, I won't get too deeply into the details uh, of this right now, but this particular group that Ginsburg was investigating called themselves Benandanti, which roughly means good travelers or good wayfarers. And they were they were good travelers because they could travel outside their bodies, and they did so for good, benevolent purposes. And they called the evil sorcerers whom they battled against Malandanti, right? Bad or evil travelers. And once Ginsburg had put together his investigation of the Benandanti into a book, which in Italian was simply called I Benandanti, in English translation it was called The Night Battles, uh, he then branched out and searched more widely for other possibly related or similar groups, which he suspected might exist elsewhere in Europe. And he found an enormous number of very similar groups who made very similar claims all over Europe, especially Central Europe, right? Most particularly in the sort of Alpine region of Switzerland, Southern Germany, Austria, Eastern France, and also to a lesser degree in other areas, in the Baltic countries, in other parts of Germany, in the Balkans, in Scotland. He found similar groups of people who made certain claims, okay, that they were a special subgroup of humankind marked out from birth. One of the ways they could be marked out, like the Benandanti, was if they had been born with the call, which means being born with part of the amniotic sack still intact on your head, which was widely believed to have some sort of magical significance, right? So they were a special distinct class of people who could venture out in spirit on, especially on particular nights of the year, such as uh, possibly Thursday nights or possibly during the ember days, right? The days just before and after the equinoxes and the solstices or on particular holidays. They could travel out at night in spirit, either riding on animals or in the forms of animals. They would meet with a goddess in many cases, especially in Western Europe. They said that they would meet with some sort of uh, goddess of animals or goddess of the hunt, whom they could call by various names, such as Diana or Herodiana, Herodias, sometimes uh, Abundia or goddess of abundance, that they would commune with this goddess and particularly would do so to protect the livestock or to protect the crops against evil spirits. And Ginsburg basically argues that this closely related network of beliefs could show up in, say, the Rhineland in eastern France, it could show up in Scotland, it could show up in Latvia, in somewhat related forms. And in Ginsburg's view, it seems to stem from some sort of older surviving stratum of Eurasian shamanism, right? And it shares a lot of similarities with shamanic practices that we still see down to the present day in Siberia, where you have particular people who are shamans, who believe that they can travel to the spirit world, travel to the world of the dead, commune with the dead, and take on the forms of animals, such as reindeer, as they sort of fly out and travel through the night. Okay, moreover, there are even more peculiar aspects of this special shamanic class that mark them out as special and that seem to represent their special relationship with the spirit world. For example, having a, a limp, right? Having in some way uneven or asymmetrical legs or feet that cause you to limp, okay? And Ginsburg actually looks back in his book, uh, Ecstasies, Deciphering the Witch's Sabbath, which in, uh, in Italian it was called Gecifrazione della Stregeria, and, and in English, it was, it was translated as ecstasies, deciphering the witch's Sabbath. 
Ginsburg points out that you can see various mythic and heroic figures in European mythology who limp, right, who have something unusual or asymmetrical about their legs, causing them to limp, such as Oedipus, right, which means the swollen foot, uh, Achilles, who has one uh, vulnerable heel, right, one, one mortal heel, uh, Pythagoras, who had one golden thigh, uh, and so on. There are many figures like this, and the stories of limping people, of people who have somehow injured or asymmetrical legs or feet, it seems to represent the fact that they are connected to the underworld, to the world of the, of, of the dead. And in you could say, in a sense, they have one foot in the grave, right? And many of these shamanic people, like the Benandanti, also say that there is something different about their legs or feet, and this causes them to limp. And sometimes in their, their, their ecstasies, their spiritual travels, they would limp. Okay, so there are these sort of oddities that you can see in all kinds of sources, right? In the inquisitorial records of interrogations of supposed heretics or magicians, sorcerers, witches, uh, in mythology, in collected folklore, in art and, and artifacts. And Ginsburg sort of musters this, these sources together to argue that there was this sort of complex of surviving shamanic beliefs that the church then distorted, right? That the church attacked as heresy, and in order to more effectively attack it, they gradually distorted it. They added in elements. In interrogations, they would suggest ideas and images to people. Did you meet with an angel? Was there an angel on a throne? Did you sign a book? They created these images and associations in order to distort these shamanic beliefs and cast them as satanic, right? So that they could then more effectively uh, suppress them, okay? So that is more or less Ginsburg's argument, and you can see other historians have found some degree of corroboration, right? Have, have taken Ginsburg's lead and found various kinds of, of, of other sources around Europe that more or less follow in the same patterns that Ginsburg is talking about. For example, uh, Eva Potch in Hungary and Emma Wilby in Scotland have examined particular confessions either of witches or of magicians or diviners that also seem to fit in this basic pattern. And we can see all kinds of uh, folk beliefs that you may have heard of, like belief in fairies, fairy people, werewolves, vampires. All of these people in some way follow a similar pattern, right? They're particular people who go out at certain nights of the year in the forms of animals, right? And often also they will go into people's homes, inspect people's homes, uh, like fairies, also Santa Claus for that matter. They enter into people's homes, inspect them, take things, sometimes leave gifts. All of these seem to be part of the basic shamanic belief in these sort of spirit travelers, right? And again, you see similar patterns among the Siberian shamans. Uh, Siberian shamans often are believed to enter into people's homes through the chimneys, inspect them, take things, take gifts, leave gifts. And you know, there, there, there's a remarkable similarity to stories of Santa Claus. And that may not be a coincidence. It may be because there is some common root here. And as for the belief in a sort of goddess of animals, goddess of the hunt, you know, this fits maybe most closely with the Margaret Murray thesis that there was a surviving uh, cult relating to a, a fertility deity or an animal deity. This idea has been taken up, of course, by modern-day Wiccans uh, as part of their teachings and practices, right? A sort of moon goddess or earth goddess, but it does seem to have a lot of corroboration in the surviving sources going all the way back into the Middle Ages. And if we go back, for example, and look at the Canon Episcopi, which I talked about before, which dates back to before 906 AD, probably back to the, roughly to the Carolingian era, we see that the, the author of the Canon Episcopi was 
very skeptical and believed that these sort of night journeys were mere delusions or dreams. But they give this passage in the document with this remarkable detail where they say, quote, some unconstrained women perverted by Satan, seduced by illusions and phantasms of demons, believe and openly profess that in the dead of night they ride upon certain beasts with the pagan goddess Diana, with a countless horde of women, and in the silence of the dead of the night to fly over the vast tracts of country and obey her commands as their mistress, and are summoned to her service on other nights. So, it seems from practically the earliest documents we can find that deal with the notion of witchcraft and sorcery, there is this continuing association with a goddess, a Diana-type goddess, right, who's called by many different names over the years. But this is a very significant detail because the author of the Canon Episcopi is not saying that this is true. Uh, is not arguing for the reality of it, but rather is saying this is what many women think, right? It's a it's claiming to be a reflection, a report of their beliefs, right? And there are many different documents of many different sorts all through the centuries that make very similar claims, right? That there is a special class of people who are mostly women, but not entirely women, who travel out in spirit form at night and commune with this sort of goddess of the hunt or goddess of animals, right? And you may remember, going even further back, you may remember in my lecture about prehistory, it seems from surviving prehistoric art that prehistoric people, especially in Europe, but in other places as well, also believed in a sort of shamanic transformation into animal form, right? And the the overwhelming theme of prehistoric art is animals. And when we see human figures like uh, the lion man or the sorcerer figure in the cave in Spain, again and again, we see human figures that are part animal, that are in the process, engaged in some sort of animal metamorphosis. Right. So it seems, you know, although the evidence is 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 sketchy, although the evidence is is scattered and there are enormous gaps, it does seem we can draw a somewhat consistent line running right from the earliest sources of any sort that we can find right up into the 15 and 1600s, that there is this persistent belief in certain people's ability to transform their souls into animal bodies or animal forms and meet with some sort of deity of the animals. And it is plausible, it seems plausible from the evidence that this is the actual foundation for witchcraft. But what we think of today as witchcraft is actually a distorted, transformed, evil mirror image of this shamanic cult into a satanic cult. Okay, so there's a lot that I brought up here in this lecture on witchcraft, which I'll probably follow up on more when I talk more about the Reformation and the Catholic Reformation, uh, but this should show you how the belief in witchcraft and the witch hunt was pervasive and was tied to and involved in all these other social and political transformations of the time. Right? It was not just a sort of fringe uh, folk phenomenon. Rather, it was, it was part of the politics, the economics, the philosophy of this age, and really was, was crucial in this sort of long transformation into the modern world. So thank you again for listening. If you have questions, comments, things you want to hear about or hear more about, please comment on SoundCloud or email me at historiansplaining at gmail.com. And if you can, please go to my Patreon page, also under Historiansplaining. Thank you.